the first question I had, so um, how much success have you had so far in, in, in your attempts to try and find a vaccine against COVID-19? Right. So right now I am part of a, t a different team. So we're kind of make one big team that's come out of Halifax um, that has been designing different types of vaccines. So I don't know how much of in the news that you've seen, but there's over yeah. 115 different vaccines in some type of stage. So we have... Um, three in coming out of Halifax uh, that are associated in different places. And we've done some immunogenicity testing, which means that we've looked at to see, are these vaccines um, able to induce antibodies that can be protective in people who are vaccinated? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of good uh, results coming out of that, showing that the virus or the the vaccine can induce antibodies that can kind of bind the virus and keep it from getting into cells. And um, now we're moving into what is more the challenge phase where we're vaccinating animals and then uh, challenging them with the virus to see how protective it is against developing disease and having kind of the virus infect in a body. I read in, 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 in preparing for this that your, your preferred animal of choice is a ferret. Um, why is that? What is so special about ferrets in, in, in your world? Right. So ferrets are an interesting animal. They have um, a respiratory tract that is quite similar to what people have. They have five different lung lobes, which is what people have. And they've also been shown to have a similar distribution of the receptors that are important for um, different viruses to enter into our cells of the respiratory tract. So they have the same distribution as people do. And this is has been shown to be true for SARS and SARS-CoV-2. In the past, ferrets have been a good model for um, for understanding disease mechanisms that are associated with influenza virus infection, as well as the original SARS from 2002, 2003. And now we see that they're also susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and the virus is able to replicate and some ferrets have um, some, some disease symptoms. It's important to mention that mice have not been shown to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. So that's a bit of a problem um, if you want to evaluate vaccines and uh, you want to use mice because they aren't going to work in the ways that we need them to. Fascinating. I, I've learned something very new about the ferret uh, today. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Um, and. So when you're talking about this, it's, it's very obvious that, that you, you're, you're working every day with something which is so important, you know, it's dominating the news. How do you deal with the pressure that's quite clearly there on you and other people doing this work, you know, to, to come up with something? It's quite, I, I would imagine it's quite a heavy burden to be carrying. Um, I, I suppose that it is, but what's, I guess, more motivating to me is that this is needed. You know, I feel that drive. I don't feel it from the outside. I want to do this. So when I first even saw the um, notification that there was this spillover, event, possible spillover event, a number of atypical pneumonia cases, uh, people were being hospitalized by this. It was something that, you know, this is my profession and what I've trained to do. So it's kind of just almost a bit of pushing play on what I know how to do and doing it, but also a huge motivator seeing, you know, people suffering and I don't want that to happen. So it's not so much that I feel people are waiting for me. It's that I really want to use my skills to this problem. And in your case, of course, you also are following in your father's footsteps. So do you think that was decisive in, in your choice of this career? Or did you fight against it and think initially, I'll do anything other than what my dad does? <laughs> um, to, so I guess when we go back to my early childhood, I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to work in a lab and... And, um, and it, when anyone asked me what I wanted to do, I said I wanted to be just like him. 
Um, but, you know, as I got closer to going to university, I was really interested in math and, um, and physics. So I actually wanted to do that first year and did quite well and had my best marks in first year physics and first year calculus. Um, but I took biology just as a backup. And over the summer, I worked in his lab to... Uh, my father's lab to kind of help make ends meet and uh, he made me pay my own tuition so I there was um, no money for me for university unless I worked for it so that's how I ended up starting in I guess molecular biology and found that I really liked it I didn't want to just as you said I did not want to I, every day when I started, I thought, I, I want to work in the pizza restaurant <laughs> on campus. Um, but after two weeks, and I was working more with his, um, I, I guess, the people in his lab that he was directing, I really loved the science. And it was, there was a disconnect there between him having any influence, because I was working with um, the people that he had in the lab and I loved it and then um, in second year university I kind of went in and did a little bit of math but more biology molecular biology and um, and then actually tried to differentiate myself later and went to the UK for um, my PhD so that I wouldn't be associated with him <laughs> oh, so, uh, in that case I'm very sorry to bring it up again um, and how was, how was the experience studying in, in, in Belfast? Oh, you know what? It was a really good opportunity. And I, it's one that I'll always uh, um, really value because it, I learned how to do science in a completely different culture. I went in thinking that it was going to be very similar to Canada. And it was in some respects, but not in others. How quickly do you think we're going to have one that's going to be usable? Because that's, that's the key, I think, to, to defeating this, or at least being able to live with it. Um, right. So, so the CanSino vaccine is now in phase one clinical trials in Canada. So that's a good step forward. Um, and it's already been in phase one in China and has moved to phase two. So CCFV, is, uh, which is the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology, is predict or is, um expecting to finish phase three by December, um, which will then Health Canada will decide if this should be continued on to a more popula population-based approved vaccine. Um, there's, of course, a lot of other candidates, uh, Vito Intervac, which is where I am now. They announced that they'll be moving to phase one trials soon, soon too, and then they had positive results. So um, we'll have you know, some options, uh, IMV or immuno vaccine, the va one of the vaccines that I am working on has also declared they'll move into phase one trials. So um, that, again, if we're looking at those timelines to complete to phase three, we're talking about, you know, December, January, where we decide if the vaccines are ready to go into a wider population. How easy is it to find people to participate in those trials? We spoke, um, I've spoken to somebody this week about who's, who's participating in the trials in Oxford. Um, yeah, so it, uh, it's actually, I think, um, been a lot easier for this than other vaccines that we've um, taken to clinical trials. Uh, I have a lot of requests every day, people interested in volunteering, which is great um, to know that people are ready to help out their community. If you're young and healthy and able no um, pre-existing conditions you're able to participate in the clinical trials you know you're really doing something good for everyone else in your community how far is international cooperation from your perspective important in tackling this virus yeah, i definitely think it's extremely important um, when we consider that 
you know, and it's been said many times, the global village and our amount of travel. Um, if we want to move forward and start to open up our borders and our economies, and as well as revisit our friends, we have to expect that there's going to be movement. And the only way to contain the virus or stop it from moving with us is a vaccine that's available to the entire world. So I think this is incredibly important. And uh, after you know, identifying a good vaccine candidate and deciding if we have enough doses for our local community, the next big challenge is, can we produce this vaccine um, for other countries, you know, that are less economically um, stable at a better price for them or, you know, in a uh, better price for us to help them. If you could say something to the world leaders who are going to be virtually gathered in London next week, what would be the one thing you'd like them to do to help people like you and researchers like yourselves to, uh, to, 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 to help you do your work? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think if we're talking about grant support, having a specific funding call to uh, support researchers that have that, uh, I guess, grand challenge of, and are taking that on to develop a vaccine that can be easily distributed globally um, would be really important.